Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath, where we can just get away from the rat race of life, what we do every day of the week, and just bask in your presence and enjoy fellowship with you and with fellow believers. We ask, Father, that as we open your holy word this morning, that your Holy Spirit, through the ministration of the angels, will be present here. Help us to understand your word, the great things from your word, and how they impact our own personal lives, our walk with Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the promise of your presence, because we ask this in the powerful and wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 36 and verse 8. As we examine the Hebrew sanctuary, one thing sticks out, I might say, as a sore thumb. And that is the predominance of angels in the Hebrew sanctuary. They seem to be all over the place. Now in Exodus 36 and verse 8, we have a description of angels that were embroidered on the different veils that were found in the Hebrew sanctuary. It says there in Exodus 36, verse 8, Then all the gifted artisans among them who worked on the tabernacle made ten curtains woven of fine linen and of blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim they made them. Of course, the cherubim are angels. So there were angels embroidered on the different veils of the Hebrew sanctuary. Now, the Bible also tells us that on the veil between the holy and the most holy place of the Hebrew sanctuary, there were cherubim embroidered as well. Notice Exodus chapter 36 and verse 35. Exodus 36 and verse 35. This is talking about the veil that divided the holy place from the most holy place. Of course, we talked about the holy place last evening where we find the seven-branch candlestick, we find the table of showbread, and we find the golden altar of incense. And then, of course, beyond the veil is the Ark of the Covenant. It says there in Exodus 36 and verse 35, And he made a veil of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine woven linen. It was worked with an artistic design of cherubim. Notice once again the idea that there were cherubim that were embroidered on this beautiful veil between the holy and the most holy place. But there were two special angels in the sanctuary. Actually, in Solomon's temple, there were four. There were two on the Ark of the Covenant, and there were two that were standing. In other words, four of them surrounded the Ark, which represents the throne of God. Let's read in Exodus chapter 25 and verses 20 through 22 about these two special cherubim that overshadowed the Ark of the Covenant. It says there in Exodus 25 and verse 20, these are instructions given to Moses, and you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. The mercy seat was the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 19, make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it on one piece with the mercy seat. Verse 20, and the cherubim, this is a key detail, and the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, and now comes a key word, covering the mercy seat, which represents God's throne, with their wings, and they shall face one another, the faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. Verse 21, you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. That's where the Shekinah came over. 
And it continues saying, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. And so they were, there were these special cherubim in the tabernacle in the wilderness, two of them on the Ark of the Covenant that overshadowed or covered the mercy seat which represents the throne of God. And in Solomon's temple, of course, we had two additional cherubim that were standing, which means that God's throne was surrounded by four. This is the reason why in Psalm 80 and verse 1, we find a description of where God sits or where God dwells. It says there in Psalm 80 and verse 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim shine forth. Where does God dwell? Where was his glory manifested? Between the cherubim. In other words, there were two covering cherubs that overshadowed the mercy seat where the glory of God was manifested in the sanctuary. Now, inside the Ark of the Covenant were found the tables of the law with the Ten Commandments. And the reason why these cherubim, according to Scripture, were looking down towards the mercy seat is they were looking down in wonder at the law of God, which is the foundation of God's government. In fact, let's read Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verses 1 through 5, where we find a description of the Ten Commandments that were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 1. It says there, at that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. Now, the reason why it says like the first is because the first tables of stone that had the Ten Commandments were thrown to the ground and broken into smithereens when Israel was worshiping the golden calf. So God tells Moses, get two more slabs of stone, and I'm going to write the Ten Commandments on those as well. So it says, and at that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain, and make yourself an ark of wood. And then God says, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them where? You shall put them in the ark. Verse 3, so I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And now notice verse 4, the only thing that God ever wrote in Scripture with his own finger. It says in verse 4, And he, that is God, wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain. And now notice, and what? Put the tablets where? In the ark which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. So notice that we find inside the ark of the covenant, the tables with the Ten Commandments. And two cherubim, in the tabernacle in the wilderness, two additional ones standing that are looking down at the mercy seat, looking down at the law in reverence for the constitution of God's government. Now in Solomon's temple, we also find a predominance of angels. Everywhere in the temple of Solomon, you find angels. Notice 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 7, there were angels carved into the walls because Solomon's temple is a solid structure. It's not made with curtains. It's actually made with solid materials. And so it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 7, he also overlaid the house, the beams and doorposts, its walls and doors with gold. And now notice, 
and he carved cherubim on the walls. In other words, on all of the walls of the Hebrew sanctuary, you find angels there carved onto the walls. Angels are very important, obviously, in the way that God administrates the universe. We find angels also on the veil that divided the holy from the most holy in the temple that was built by Solomon. Notice 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 14. It says there, And he made the veil of blue, purple, crimson, and fine linen, and wove cherubim into it. Also in Solomon's temple, which, by the way, is a misnomer because it's the, the temple that was built by Solomon, we find these cherubim that covered the Ark of the Covenant. Notice 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verses 7 and 8. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, 7, and 8. We're now noticing the temple that was built by Solomon. It has the same principle. Angels everywhere. Angels carved on the walls. Angels on this veil between the holy and most holy place. And we're going to notice now that they were covering cherubs as well. It says there in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 7, Then the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place. This is after the temple is built into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place, under, notice, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. So notice the idea that these cherubim actually overshadow or they cover the Ark of the Covenant as they're looking down in reverence towards God's law. But there were not only cherubim in the sanctuary, there were also six-winged creatures, angels known as seraphim. Notice Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. There were lots of angels in the sanctuary. Notice Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, which is another order of angel besides the cherubim who had four wings. Now we find seraphim who have six wings. It says there in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And now notice, and above it, that is above the throne, stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, that is in reverence for God. With two he covered his feet, also a sign of reverence to God. And with two he flew. And by the way, if you want to know how powerful are the voices of these seraphim, if you continue reading there in Isaiah chapter 6, it tells us that when the seraphim sang, holy, 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 the temple literally shook. In other words, these are powerful angels who have powerful vocal cords. Now we must ask the question, who are angels? You know, there's a common theory today running even in the Christian world, and that is that angels are spirits of the departed that come back to help those who are still walking on planet Earth. Perhaps this was popularized by a program on television many years ago that was called Highway to Heaven with Michael Landon. May I see many of you saying, yeah, we remember that. You know, supposedly he died and then he came back to this earth to help people on earth and he came back as an angel. The fact is that the Bible does not sustain such an idea. The angels are a separate order of being that existed before human beings existed. Go with me to Job chapter 38 and verses 4 through 7. And what we're studying is extremely important. We're going to study later on about the state of the dead. And you better understand that angels will not come at, as the spirits of the departed to talk with you and to communicate with you. This is a misconception that exists even within the Christian world, unfortunately. Job 38 and verses 4 through 7. I want to show you that the angels existed before this earth was created. It says there, and God asked Job a series of questions, 
Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? And then God says with a touch of sarcasm, surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? And now notice, this is speaking about creation, obviously. And something happened at creation. Verse 7, when the morning stars, what? Sang together and all the sons of God did what? Shouted for joy. Let me ask you, did the stars of God, the sons of God exist when this world was created? Absolutely. Very clearly, it speaks about God laying the foundations of the earth, and we're told that when God did that, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So the angels are a separate order of being that existed before this world came into existence. Now let's talk a little bit about the number of angels and their organization. Let's deal, first of all, with the fact that the angels have a commander-in-chief. Let's go to the book of Joshua, chapter 5, and verses 13 through 15. Joshua, chapter 5, and verses 13 through 15. Here we find Joshua outside the city of Jericho. The city of Jericho is about to fall before the Israelites. And there's this individual that comes and meets Joshua, and he has a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua asked him, he says, are you of those who are with us or are you against us? And I want you to notice how this uh, conversation develops in Joshua chapter 5 and beginning with verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14. So he said, No, but as what? As commander of the army of the Lord. Do the angels have a commander? Absolutely. Commander of the army of the Lord. I have come now. And Joshua, now notice who this messenger is. This is not any common, ordinary angel. This is the commander of the angelic souls. It's none other than Jesus Christ, according to most scholars. It says there, uh, continuing in verse 14, So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and what? Worshipped. This was not a common angel. Because angels refuse worship, according to Revelation 19, verse 10, and Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. But there's more. It says, He fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy and Joshua did so. The same thing that happened at the burning bush took place here outside of Jericho. This messenger, this commander, was none other than Jesus Christ himself. Now, do you know that the angels are organized in military fashion? They function in exact order, and they function in companies. You say, how do we know this? Because in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 53, Jesus said some words that we're probably all acquainted with. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 53, when they came to arrest Jesus, Jesus said some very interesting words. He said, Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than what? Than 12 legions of angels? Are the angels organized in legions? Absolutely. And what were legions? Legions were divisions or companies of the Roman army. In other words, God also has the angels organized in military fashion. Now, I'd like to throw out an idea. If you want to read an interesting chapter about how the angels function within God's sanctuary, you need to read Ezekiel chapter 1. It's not talking about a UFO. 
in Ezekiel chapter 1. It's talking there about God's throne and how God, through his angels, administrates the universe and keeps the universe functioning in order. And everything functions there in Ezekiel chapter 1 with absolute military precision. Now, what about the number of the angels? Well, the good news is that there are two good angels versus one bad one. So the bad ones are outnumbered. But how many angels are there? Notice Psalm 68 and verse 17, where we find an indication of the number of angels. It says there, speaking about the chariots of God, which are his angels, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11, we find another indication as to the number of the angels. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was what? 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You know, in the Greek language, there's no name for million. There's no number for million. And so the way in which you express millions is by multiplying thousands. And so it says here, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That means millions. Notice also Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. Here we're once again told about the number of the angelic messengers. It says there, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and then it says to a what? To an innumerable company of angels. How many angels are we talking about? We're talking about millions and millions of angels. I can't tell you how many, but they're, they are innumerable according to Scripture. Now let's talk a little bit about the mission of the angels. What is the importance of the angels? What do the angels do? Do they just sit around playing their harps and praising the Lord? Absolutely not. Each one of them has their function with regards to planet Earth. Notice Matthew chapter 4 and verse 11. This is speaking about Jesus after he had gone through the grueling experience of the three temptations. And it says... Uh, by the way, he was famished because he had gone 40 days and 40 nights without eating. We're told here that the angels did something with him. Matthew chapter 4, verse 11 says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and what? And ministered to him. What is the role of the angels? The role of the angels is to what? To minister. They're ministering here to Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 tells us that they not only ministered to Jesus, but they also ministered to those who will inherit salvation. It says there in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, speaking about the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who shall inherit salvation? In other words, the angels are ministers of Jesus Christ to meet the needs of those who are being wooed to salvation. By the way, do you remember the dream that Jacob had when he had to flee from home? He saw the, a vision of this ladder that reached to the highest heaven and its base was planted upon the earth. And what were ascending and descending upon the ladder? Angels of God were ascending and descending upon the ladder. That means that the angels are the emissaries of Jesus Christ. They take our prayers to God, our pleas to God, and they bring answers of God to us. In fact, let's read about that ladder in John chapter 1 and verse 51. Jesus applies the ladder to himself. John chapter 1 and verse 51. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and what? Ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. 
In other words, the angels are the emissaries of Jesus Christ to bear our praises and our thanks and our requests to Jesus and to bring the answers of God back to us. Incidentally, the Bible several times uses the possessive pronoun to refer to the angels. It says, when Jesus comes with all his holy angels, so the angels are his. He's the maximum commander that tells them what to do and how to minister to those who will inherit salvation. Now, do you know that sin, and we're going to study this in a few moments, sin originated in heaven. And it originated before this world existed. And it involves the angels. This is a very important detail that we need to keep in mind because we're going to study about this a little bit later on in our series. The angels are involved in the great controversy between good and evil. Because the Bible tells us that one-third of the angels decided to accept the arguments of Lucifer and went over to the evil side. Which means that even before sin came into this world, the angels were involved in the controversy between good and evil. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9, we find a very interesting little word. The angels are not passive bystanders in the, bystanders in the great controversy. They are actively engaged. They are observing what is happening in the universe. They are observing how God is solving the problem of sin in harmony with his character. The angels actually are called upon to impart God's message to the prophets. They're called upon to seek to persuade sinners to repent. They're called upon to protect the people on earth from the power of the evil one. They're sent to bring God's word to the minds of people so that they can use the word of God as a weapon in times of need. They actually speak to the voice of conscience so that we choose to do good and we reject evil. They're actively engaged in this great controversy between good and evil. Notice what the Apostle Paul had to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9. He says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have become, or we have been made, a spectacle. What are we? We are a spectacle to the world, both to what? To angels and to men. That word spectacle is the Greek word theatron, where we get our word theater from. In other words, there's this dramatic thing that is happening in the universe. And the angels and men are watching what is happening to decide whether God acts in harmony with his character, how God is going to solve this sin problem. Do you know that the Bible tells us that when sinners repent, the angels rejoice? There's a close connection between heaven and earth. Notice Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. I hope that you're looking up the verses ahead of time because, you know, we really have to advance. There's so much material to cover. Luke 15 and verse 10. Here Jesus says, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the what? Of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I can imagine the angels saying, Ha, we rescued another one from the hands of the devil. They become very happy when God wins over subjects on earth to himself. By the way, do you know that God also confesses our name before his angels? Notice what we find in Luke chapter 12 and verses 8 and 9. Luke chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. I want you to see that there's a close connection between heaven and earth, between the angels and human beings. The angels are engaged in the great controversy. They're watching what's happening. Luke 12, verses 8 and 9. Also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And so, folks, the angels are actively engaged in watching what is happening here. They rejoice when sinners repent, and Jesus confesses our name when we come to Jesus and we're not ashamed of him. Now let's talk a little bit about loyal and disloyal 
angels. You see, this whole mess that we are experiencing on planet Earth actually began in heaven. And not only in heaven, but it began in the most holy place of the sanctuary. You're saying, what? The problem of sin began in the most holy place of the sanctuary? And by the way, it involved God's holy law. Now let's talk about the origin of evil in heaven. Later on in this series, we're going to talk about the origin of evil on earth. You see, sin began with an, a being who is known as Lucifer. In fact, let's read about his origin in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, and we'll read verse 13, and then we'll go to verse 15. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. Speaking about this majestic being, who, by the way, was a cherub, it says here, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Did you know that the garden of Eden was in heaven before it was placed on earth? It was a piece of heaven transplanted to the earth. It says here, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day, here's a very important detail, on the day you were created. And let's notice verse 15. For you were perfect in your ways from the day you were, the same idea again, from the day you were what? You were created till iniquity was found in you. Let me ask you, is evil eternal? Is Satan eternal? Is Lucifer eternal? No, because he was what? He was created, which means that evil will come to an end. Evil and good will not exist forever as competing systems. Evil will be eradicated from the universe. It had a beginning, and it will have an end. So the first thing we notice is that this being was created. Now, what did he look like when he was created? Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. It's using the king of Tyre as an, an example. It says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the what? The seal of of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in what? Perfect in beauty. And verse 15 says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So my question is this, does the Bible tell us that this being was originally perfect and beautiful, absolutely blameless in his ways? He was created not with a taint of sin, no inclination towards sin. Now the question is, what was his job? Well, the Bible tells us what his job was. Notice Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 13, and we're going to read only the last part of this verse because we already read the first part. It says in Ezekiel 28 and verse 13, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now, timbrels are like a tambourine to mark the beat of the music. And the word pipes means flutes. In other words, Lucifer was created to be a what? To be a musician. Do you think he knows a little bit about music? Do you think he can use music, even Christian music, in the world today to lead people astray? Absolutely. He's the master musician. He knows how music affects us physically, mentally, psychologically, and spiritually. And he not only uses secular music, but many times he uses so-called sacred music to distract people from God. Now the question is, what was his position? The fact is, the Bible tells us that he was one of the two covering cherubs next to the throne of God. In other words, he was in the very presence of God, in the temple of God on Mount Zion in the New Jerusalem. Notice what we find in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 14 where it speaks about his position. It says here, you were the anointed cherub who what? Remember that word that we read in Exodus? It says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. This is the heavenly Mount Zion. 
You walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. The fiery stones represent the angels. He walked back and forth in the midst of the angels, according to Scripture. He was one of the two covering cherubs that were over the throne of God. Let's read Exodus 25 and verse 20 once again. So you see the, the key word, covering. It says there in Exodus 25 and verse 20, And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above. Notice the key word now. Covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. Now you're saying, Pastor, are you saying that in heaven there is an Ark of the Covenant and there's two cherubim that cover the Ark of the Covenant just like in the sanctuary on earth? Absolutely. In our first lecture, we studied that the earthly sanctuary was a shadow or was a copy of what? Of the heavenly sanctuary. So there is an Ark of the Covenant in heaven. And God in person is the Shekinah there. And there are two covering cherubs over the Ark. You say, where does the Bible say that there is such a place in heaven? Notice what we find in the book of Revelation, chapter 11 and verse 19. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Very clearly, there is a temple in heaven with an Ark of the Covenant. It says there, then the temple of God was what? Was opened where? In heaven. And what is seen when the temple is open in heaven? It says, and the ark of his what? Of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. So my question is, is there an ark of the covenant in the heavenly sanctuary? Absolutely. Are there covering cherubs that cover the ark of the covenant, overshadow the ark of the covenant? Absolutely. And what do you suppose is found inside the Ark of the Covenant? What was inside the Ark of the Covenant on earth? The tables of the law, the Ten Commandments. The earthly is a reflection of the heavenly. So what must be in the heavenly sanctuary? Underneath the place where God manifests His presence as the foundation of His throne, the Ten Commandments must be in the heavenly temple. Now let's talk a little bit about Lucifer's sin. Do you know what Lucifer wanted to do? He wanted to overthrow the government of God. In fact, he wanted to take over the throne of the universe. He suffered a severe case of spiritual myopia. He was nearsighted. All he could see was himself. In fact, let's read about that in Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 through 14. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. It says there, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Now notice the key word here. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That is above the angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. What is the key word in this passage? I. He didn't want God to be the ruler any, anymore. He wanted to take over the government of the universe by sitting upon God's throne. I want you to remember that expression, I will be like the Most High because in a couple of lectures, we're going to talk about how the devil tempted Eve and how he was successful in gaining the victory over Eve. He used the same method because it, because it worked in heaven. He said to Eve, you shall be like the Most High. The, the temptation on earth was simply a replica of what happened in heaven. And when we study this lecture, you're going to see that. Now the Bible tells us that Lucifer sinned. Notice Ezekiel 28 and verse 16. The word is used. It says in Ezekiel 28 and verse 16, By the abundance of your trading, speak about, speaking about Lucifer, you became filled with violence and within, and you what? And you sinned. Question, did Lucifer sin? He most certainly did. Now, since when has the devil sinned? Many Christians think that the law was given for the first time on Mount Sinai. In other words, when the Ten Commandments were given to Mount Sinai, that's the first time that the law comes in. Can't be. 
I want you to notice 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. It's speaking here about where sin originated, when sin originated. It says there in 1 John 3 and verse 8, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned since Mount Sinai. Is that what the Bible says? No. It says the devil has sinned from when? From the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? Sin, right? So did Jesus come to destroy the law or did he come to destroy sin? He came to destroy sin. Now the question is, what is sin? We're, we're told that, that Lucifer sinned and he sinned at the very beginning. Now what is sin? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 has the biblical definition of sin. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. It says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, for sin is what? Lawlessness. Or as the King James says, sin is the transgression of the law. Now the question is, how could Lucifer sin if there was no law to transgress? Must there have been a law in order for Lucifer to sin? Absolutely. And the law was inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now some people might say, how could a perfect being that was created blameless and had no tendencies to toward evil suddenly come up with the idea of rebelling against God? All I can say is that for some strange reason, unexplainable reason, he decided to use his freedom of choice against God. This shows that even in heaven, God respected freedom of choice because he allowed this angel to say no to him. Now, why would he say no when he was perfect and blameless and beautiful and had no inclination or tendency to sin? That's a mystery. And if we could give an explanation of that, then we would be able to give a reason for sin and ultimately God would be to blame for sin. But of course, God isn't. So Lucifer sinned. He went against the law that was found inside the Ark of the Covenant. But of course, just one being against the government of God wouldn't cut it. And so what he had to do was spread his rebellion. He had to recruit followers. He had to recruit people that would accept his arguments and decide to follow him instead of following God. But of course, for this, he had to give God a black eye. He had to make God look bad, because, you know, if he made, you know, if he made God look good, nobody would want to follow him. So he had to malign the character of God. He had to say, the law of God is restrictive. It takes away your freedom. All he wants is slaves. All he wants is blind service. We're going to find he said the same thing to Eve in the Garden of Eden. And I am the great emancipator. I have come to deliver you from the law. I have come to give you freedom so that you can follow the inclinations of your own heart because your own heart will always show you what is right and what is wrong without God having to tell you what is right and what is wrong. And so the Bible tells us, if you go with me to Ezekiel 28 and verse 16, the first part of the verse, there's an interesting little word that is used. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 16 says, speaking about Lucifer, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. That word trading is very, very interesting. It's a commercial word. You can look it up in a concordance if you wish. It has to do with buying and selling. And so somehow Lucifer was trying to sell something to the heavenly beings. The question is, what was he trying to sell them? The fact is, he was trying to sell them lies. Do you know that even today, we use a figurative expression when somebody tells us that we find hard to believe, we say, I don't buy that. You see, we have a remnant of this idea of buying and selling. His trading was that he wanted to sell his lies to the heavenly hosts. In fact, we're told in John chapter 8 and verse 44, John chapter 8 and verse 44, that he is the father of all lies. Jesus says there, speaking of the Jew, to the Jews of his day, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's why we call him the father of lies. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4, the first part of the verse, and notice how he drew a third part of the angels with him. He used something to draw them. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4, the first part of the verse. Speaking about this dragon, which symbolizes Satan, it says his what? His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, that is a third of the angels, and threw them to the earth. Now what is this that he used his tail to draw a third of the angels to his side? Well, Isaiah 9 verse 15 tells us what the tail represents. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15 explains the symbolic meaning of the tail. It says there, the elder and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches what? Who teaches lies, he is what? The tail. So what did the devil draw a third of the angels with him with? With his tail, which means that he lied to the heavenly angels. Incidentally, that word trading that is used in Ezekiel chapter 28, the root of that word is also used in two other texts in the Old Testament that I want to read now. Notice what we find in Ezekiel 22 and verse 9, the same root word that is translated trading in chapter 28. It says here in chapter 22 and verse 9, In you, speaking about Tyre, in you are men who slander. That's the same root word. Who slander to cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat on the mountains. In your midst they commit lewdness. So notice here that the same root word is translated what? slander. So what did Lucifer do? He slandered God and his character. This word is also used in Leviticus 19 and verse 16. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 16. Notice what it says there. God is speaking to Israel. He says, you shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. The same root word that is translated trading. It says, you shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Now, what did his lies look like? One of my favorite book, books is called Patriarchs and Prophets. It's a story of uh, the Old Testament up to the time of the Hebrew kings from the time that sin originated in heaven. So I want to read you a statement that's found in Great Controversy, page well, excuse me, this is from Great Controversy. It's also in Patriarchs and Prophets. But the reference is in Great Controversy, page 499. Same writer, Ellen White. She says this, speaking about Lucifer. He reiterated his claim that angels needed no control, but should be left to follow their own will, which would ever guide them right. In other words, don't let God tell you what to do. Your heart will tell you what to do. He denounced, now notice, he denounced the divine statutes as a restriction of their liberty and declared that it was his purpose to secure the abolition of law that freed from this restraint, the hosts of heaven might enter upon a more exalted, more glorious state of existence. So if there's anyone out there teaching that the law was nailed to the cross or that it was abolished, it's a repetition of the lies of the father of lies. Because God is not going to abolish the constitution of his government to save sinners. What he does is provide someone who takes the penalty upon himself to save sinners. But he doesn't do away with his law. The Bible tells us that as a result of the arguments of Satan, war broke out in heaven. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4, the first part of the verse, and then we'll go to verses 7 through 9. It says there in chapter 12 and verse 4, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. 
Verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, by the way, that's Jesus Christ. You say, oh, you're saying that, that Michael is Jesus? Yes, but you need to understand that the Seventh-day Adventist church believes that even though Jesus is spoken of as Michael, he's not, he wasn't created by God. He is eternal God. He's called Michael in Scripture, which means who is like God? It's a name of a challenge. Who is like God? But we don't believe like some churches in the world that think that Michael was the first creature of God and Jesus was the first creation of God. We believe that Jesus Christ is eternal God, even though he's called Michael here. And so it says, Michael and his angels, that is Jesus and his angels, fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. So there was this war in heaven. And it says in verse 8, but they did not prevail, that is the devil and his angels, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now a question that comes up is this, why didn't God destroy Satan immediately? Think about it. The devil had said that God was a tyrant, that his law was restrictive, that God didn't respect freedom. And so now all of these angels say, we're going to go against God, and God snuffs them out. What would happen? The angels would say, well, maybe Lucifer was right. Look, because he didn't respect his freedom of choice, he snuffed him out. So God said, I have to allow the principles of Lucifer's government to develop so that all of the universe can see what his plan of government is like. Let me ask you, has his plan of government been successful? Just look at the world today. Tell me, is a world without law a successful government? Absolutely not. It is a mess. But the heavenly beings would have never known it unless God allowed evil to what? To develop and to mature. And by the way, God is going to make the devil sit down for a thousand years here without having anyone to tempt because everybody is going to be dead. All of his followers are going to be dead. God's people are going to be in heaven. And God is going to force the devil to sit there and he's going to say, look at what you have done. You see, if God had snuffed Lucifer out, the heavenly beings would have probably served God, but they would have served him out of fear, not out of love. And they would have wondered, who is the next who is going to disappear from the scene, who uses his or freedom of choice to go against God. Now let's talk about Lucifer's end, because he will have an end. The purpose of the sanctuary we're going to find in this series is that God, through the sanctuary service, is exonerating his character. God, in other words, the purpose of allowing this whole thing to transpire before the angels, before the heavenly beings, before this earth, is to show how God solves the sin problem in harmony with his character so that when sin is destroyed, everyone will say, God is right, God is love, God is just, God is good. Lucifer will come to an end. We're told in Malachi chapter 4, and verse 3, that root and branch of evil will be destroyed. It says there, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. This is verse 1. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither what? Will leave them neither root nor branch. Let me ask you, who is the root? The root of all evil is the devil. And who are the branches? his followers. Do you remember Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches? Well, the devil also is the root and he has his branches. And so the Bible says that root and branches will be eradicated once and for all. In fact, Ezekiel 28, that passage that we studied several texts from this morning, Ezekiel 28 verses 18 and 19 tells us what the final end of this being will be and all those who choose to follow him. It says there in Ezekiel 28, in verse 18, speaking about this being, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading, that is, by the iniquity of your lying. Therefore, what is God going to do? I brought what? Fire from your midst. And what did it do? 
It devoured you, and it turned you to what? To ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror, and now notice, and shall be no more forever. Is that good news? The question is, who are we going to ally our lives with? You see, to be with the devil is to be with a loser. It's already been predicted that he's the loser. If you're with him, you're going to lose. If you're with Jesus, you're going to win because Jesus already won on the cross, according to what we're going to study in this seminar. Now the question is, after sin is eradicated, will it ever rise again? Listen, what person in his right mind would ever want to experiment with sin again after seeing what sin has caused? You see, one of the reasons why God allows sin to proliferate and to develop is so that God's people can see what it means to live independently of God, what it means to trample upon His law. At the very end, people will say, it's a mess when you go down that road. And people will exalt God's law because the law will be written upon their hearts. People will see that the law of God is holy, just, and good as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. We will see that sin is the evil culprit, not God's law. You see, God's law is holy. It shows that sin is bad. So what do you do? You get rid of the law that is good in order to solve the problem of sin, which is bad? Of course not. It does no good to do away with the law. In fact, we're told in Nahum, our last verse, Nahum 1 and verse 9, that affliction will not rise a second time. And then the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4 that God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, and no more death. Because God will live, uh, live with us and we will live with Him. And forevermore, the universe will be secure because it has been inoculated against sin. Do you want to be there? Thank you.